Hey, what's up guys? My name is Echerno and welcome to another episode of my C++ series. So today we're gonna learn all about how C++ works. We're gonna kind of try and keep it simple for now, but we're gonna learn about how we go from the source file, the actual text file, to an actual executable binary, so a program that we can run. The basic workflow of writing a C++ program is you have a series of source files, which you write actual text in, and then you pass it through a compiler, which compiles it into some kind of binary. Now that binary can be some sort of library or it can be an actual executable program. Today we're gonna to talk specifically about executable programs or executable binaries. So let's hop on over to Visual Studio and check it out. Okay, so here we have our Hello World application that we wrote in the previous video when we learned how to set up C++ on Windows. It's a pretty basic program, but there are quite a number of things going on here. First of all, we have this include IO stream statement. Now this is something called a preprocessor statement. Anything that begins with a hash is a preprocessor statement. The first thing that a compiler does when it receives a source file is it preprocesses all of your preprocessor statements. That's why they're called preprocessor statements because they happen just before the actual compilation. In this case, it's something called include. What include will do is find a file. So in this case, we're looking for a file called iostream. Take all of the contents of that file and just paste it into this current file. These files that you include are typically called header files and we'll discuss them more in depth as the series goes on. The reason we're including something called iostream is because we need a declaration for a function called cout, which lets us print stuff to our console. Next, we have this main function. Now, the main function is very important because every C++ program has something like this. The main function is called the entry point. It's the entry point for our application. That means that when we run our application, our computer starts executing code that begins in this function. As the program is running, our computer will execute the lines of code that we type in order. Of course, there are certain things that can break or change the order of execution, and those are primarily called control flow statements or calls to other functions. But the gist is that our code gets executed line by line. So the first thing that will get executed in our application will be this hello world cout statement. And then the next thing is this cin.get function. And then since that's all that we've got inside our main function, our program will terminate. Now, for those of you who are familiar with functions, you might notice that the return type for main is actually int. However, we're not returning an integer. That's because the main function is actually a special case. You don't have to return any kind of value from the main function. If you don't return anything, it will assume that you're returning a zero. This only applies to the main function though, as a special case. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what this is actually doing. This kind of syntax might look strange for someone who's new to C++, and it is a little bit unfortunate that it's actually written this way because it doesn't make too much sense when you first look at it. But basically these left angular brackets, which look kind of like a bit shift left operator, are actually just an overloaded operator. So you need to think of them as a function. Now I know they look like an operator, but here's the thing. Operators are just functions. So in this case, this would actually be the same thing as if it was something like cout.print and then hello world is our parameter. And then maybe we would follow it on along with another print. That's all it is. You have to think of these operators as functions. And if you think of them that way, then this makes a little bit more sense. So what we're actually doing here is we're pushing this hello world string into this cout, which basically causes it to get printed to the console. And then we're pushing an end line. This end line basically just tells our console to advance to the next line. The cin.get function in our case will basically just wait until we press enter before advancing to our next line of code, which is nothing. So basically what I'm saying is our program's execution will pause on this line until we press enter, because this function is just going to wait for us to press enter. And then we advance to the next line, which is nothing, which means that we actually return zero, meaning our program executed successfully. And that's it, that is our entire program. Okay, so that's our source file. We've actually got a file called main.cpp, which is a source file. How do we get from this text to an actual executable binary file? So basically we go through a few stages. First, we have this include IO stream. This is something called a preprocessor statement. So this preprocessor statement gets evaluated before we compile the file. In this case, what it does is it includes all of the contents of the IO stream file into this file. And I mean, literally, it just, it copies and pastes that file into this file. And again, as I said, we will talk about header files in more depth in the future. So don't worry too much if you don't understand this. For now, all you need to know is we include this file so that we can use the cout and cin functions. Once our preprocessor statements have been evaluated, our file gets compiled. This is the stage where our compiler transforms all of this C++ code into actual 
machine code. There are several important settings that determine how this actually happens, so let's take a brief look at them. In Visual Studio, we have these two important drop-down menus up here. One's called a solution configuration and one's called a solution platform. By default, this will probably be set to debug and then either x86 or win32, they're actually the same. If we drop down the debug, you'll see that we've got two options, debug and release. These two options are defaults for any new project in Visual Studio. And then under solution platform, you'll see we've got x64 and x86 as our two options. Again, these are just defaults. A configuration is simply a set of rules which applies to the building of a project. Whereas a solution platform is what platform we're targeting with our current compilation. So a good example of that would be x86 is targeting Windows 32-bit, which means that we will generate a 32-bit application for Windows. For more complicated projects where you might be targeting different platforms, you might have Android as a platform in that dropdown. And then if you wanted to build and deploy and debug on Android, you would change your platform to be Android. And the solution configuration is a set of rules that defines the compilation for that platform. So let's take a look at some of the rules that we can change. In our project, let's right click on it and hit properties. So here we have Visual Studio's property pages. These define the rules that are used to build certain configurations and platforms. The first thing that you need to notice is this configuration and platform area. Make sure that your configuration and your platform is set to the one that you actually want to modify. For some reason, sometimes it might be set to release. However, you're clearly building debug, which means that none of these changes will apply to your current configuration. And if you missed that, you might be wondering why nothing's working. I've had that happen a few times. It's kind of annoying. So we've got our debug configuration. You can see we've got Win32. Now Win32 is exactly the same as x86. Okay, they are the same. They've got different names for some reason, but they are the same. Here we've got some general information about our SDK version, our output directory, our intermediate directory, and stuff like that. The important thing to note here is that our configuration type is set to application. If we wanted it to be a library, we could, we could change it here. But this is basically the binary that the compiler will output. Since we're going for an executable binary, we'll leave it set to application.exe. The compiler settings are located under C, C++. We've got important settings here, such as include directories, optimization settings that we may want to use, code generation settings, preprocessor definitions, and a whole lot of stuff that we're not even gonna touch anytime soon. The default Visual Studio configuration is actually pretty good, so we don't really have to do anything. But these are the rules that govern how our files will get compiled. You can see the difference between the debug and the release configuration pretty well if you go into the optimization tab. Under optimization, if I change this to release, you'll see that the optimization is set to maximize speed, whereas in debug, it's set to disabled. That's a great example of why debug mode by default is slower, a lot slower than release mode, because optimization is turned off. But of course, turning off optimization will help us to debug our code, as we will later discover. If you want to know more about how the compiler works, I've made a dedicated video in depth covering exactly how all of that happens. So go check that out if you're interested. The link will be in the description below. Each CPP file in our project gets compiled. Header files do not get compiled at all, just CPP files. Remember, header files get included via a preprocessor statement called include into a CPP file, and that's when they get compiled. So we've got a bunch of CPP files that we've compiled, and they actually get compiled individually. Every CPP file will get compiled into something called an object file. The extension for that using Visual Studio's compiler is .obj. Once we have all of those individual obj files, which are the result of compiling our CPP files, we need some way to stitch them together into one exe file. And that's where our friend the linker comes in. You can see the linker settings under this linker tab, but basically what the linker does is it takes all of those obj files and it glues them together. So the linker's job is to take all of our obj files and stitch them together into one exe file. Of course, the way that it does that is actually kind of complicated, so I've made a specific video covering that. Go ahead and check that out. The link will be in the description below. So let's take a look at this in action. The first thing I'm gonna do is actually just compile this CPP file. In Visual Studio, you can compile files individually by hitting Control F7. You can see our output here shows that we're actually building this main.cpp file and that it succeeded. If you don't wanna hit Control F7, you can actually bring up this compile button. You can do so by right clicking here and clicking on build and then going add or remove buttons, customize, and then adding a command under build called compile. 
So if we hit that button, you can see that we get our file compiling. If we were to make some kind of syntax error here, for example, I'm forgetting a semicolon, if I compile that file, you'll see that we get an error. Now Visual Studio presents us with errors in many different ways, one of which is this error list, and another way is inside this output window. I'm gonna tell you guys right now, this error list is mostly garbage. It might appear to be readable for really small things like this, but you never ever want to rely on it. A lot of the times it's actually missing information. The way that the error list works is it basically parses our output window looking for the word error and then grabs information from there that it can find and puts it into this error list. So it's, it's a good overview. You wanna use it like an overview, but if you want more details and if you want all the information about the error that you've just had, look at the output window. So for the rest of this series, I am actually going to be looking at this output window for error messages, so get used to that. You can see that we've got an error here. It says syntax error missing semicolon before a curly bracket. It tells you which line number the error is on. If you double click on this actual line, you will be taken to where the error is in your source code. So let's go ahead and fix that by adding a semicolon and then hitting control F7 or compile to build this one file. So we've compiled a file. When you compile files individually, no linking happens obviously. You're just compiling a single file. So the linker isn't invoked at all. Let's go ahead and check out what the compiler actually generated. If we right click on our Hello World project, you'll see an open folder in File Explorer button. This will open up our File Explorer. By default, Visual Studio will output our built files into this debug folder. And you can see if we go in there, you can see a main.obj file. This is the object file that our compiler has generated. Again, you will have one of these for every single C++ file in your project. If we go back to Visual Studio and we build the actual project, so I'm doing more than just building one file here, I'm actually building the entire project. You can see that we actually get that exe file. And again, if we go back to our file explorer, that will actually be in the directory of your solution and then in the debug folder. I know Visual Studio's default paths are a little bit weird. I usually like to change them, but I'm trying not to complicate things here. And there's our hello world.exe file, which we can run and it prints the text hello world. So that's a pretty simple overview, but what happens when we have multiple C++ files? Let's take a look at a simple example. So suppose that we've got our hello world printing to the console here, but I don't want to use the cout function. I want to use my own logging function. And then maybe that will wrap this cout function. So let's create a function called log, which will take in a C string called message and print that message to the console. Simple enough. Now don't worry, if you're not sure what a const char pointer is, we're gonna talk about strings in another video. For now, all you have to know is that a const char pointer is basically just a type that can hold a string of text. So now we can rewrite our code so that instead of calling C out and then printing hello world, we call this log function and then pass in hello world as a parameter. We can go ahead and hit the local windows debugger button here just to make sure that it still works. And you can see it does. Fantastic, we've written our first function. That was easy. So now let's take that function and put it into a different file because I don't wanna have this main.cpp file cluttered with all of my code. I wanna separate my code into multiple files to keep things nice and clean and organized. We'll make a new file under source files by going right click add new item. We'll make a cpp file. We'll call it log.cpp and we'll click add. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to main and I'm going to cut this log function and paste it into here. So now we've got a function inside our log.cpp file called log. Let's try and compile just this file. Hey, check this out. We get a bunch of errors. And if we look at our output window, you'll see that C out is not a member of STD. Basically it's telling us that it has no idea what C out is. The reason is because we haven't included the declaration for C out. Every kind of symbol in C++ needs some kind of declaration. C out is defined inside a file that we included in main.cpp. And that file, of course, was iostream. So let's go ahead and grab iostream and put it at the top of this file so that we include iostream. By doing so, we include a declaration for this C out function. Let's go ahead and compile the this file once again. You can see now it succeeds, great. So back in main, I want to call this log function. Can I do that? Let's hit control F7. No, I can't because log is not found. We also get a complaint about C in, but we already know that that's because we removed the IO stream include and we have no idea what C in is. We can restore that include and our problem should be fixed. 
However, you can see that log is still not found. So what's going on here? We've moved a function from one file into the other, and we are compiling each file separately for the minute. So this main.cpp file has no idea that there's a function called log somewhere. And since it doesn't recognize what log is, it gives us a compile error. We can fix this by providing something called a declaration. A declaration is exactly what it sounds like. We're declaring that something called log exists. Now this is almost like a promise because we can just say, hey, compiler, there's a function called log. However, the compiler will just believe us. And that's the great thing about the compiler. It'll be like, oh yeah, cool, I totally trust you. Because the compiler doesn't care about resolving where that log function actually is defined. So we have two different words here, declarations and definitions. Declarations are just a statement which say, hey, this symbol, this function exists. And then a definition is something that says, this is what this function is. This is the body of this function. So let's go ahead and write a declaration for our log function. A declaration looks very similar to an actual definition. This is something called a definition because you can see that not only have we declared something with the name log, a function with the name log, we've also given it a body which actually contains what code will run when we call this function. So back in main, let's write a declaration. And a declaration looks very similar to a definition. However, what it doesn't have is the actual body. So you can see I can just put a semicolon at the end of this and that is the end of that. In fact, you don't even have to specify the name of the parameter because it doesn't matter. You can just write that. As a rule of thumb though, I do like to specify the name because it makes more sense. So let's compile this file now. Hey look, check this out. The compiler totally bought it. So you might be wondering at this stage, well, well hey, how does the compiler know that we actually have a log function in another file if we're just compiling this one file? And the answer is it doesn't, it just, it trusts us. So then your second question should be, how does it actually run the right code? That is where the linker comes in. When we build our entire project, not just this one file, but if I actually right click and hit build, once our files have been compiled, the linker will actually find the definition of that log function and wire it up to the log function that we call here in main.cpp. If it can't find that definition, that's when we get a linker error. Now, linking errors are something that look very scary and a lot of people get scared. So let's go ahead and look at an example of that. So right now, if I just run my program, you'll see that it still prints out the text hello world and everything runs successfully. However, let's remove this or at least change it a little bit. For example, I'll change this to logger, save the file, go back here to main.cpp. I'll try and compile this file by itself. You can see that we get no problems whatsoever. However, let's right click on this hello world and hit build. And check this out. We get a pretty scary looking error message, which also unfortunately looks scary in our output window. Now the reason this looks so scary is because it's actually got some extra information about our function's signature. For example, it's got the calling convention here as well as an actual ID. But basically what it's telling you is that you have an unresolved external symbol called log, which returns, which has this return value and these parameters, and you're referencing this function inside main. An unresolved external symbol means that the linker was unable to resolve a symbol. Remember, the linker's job is to resolve symbols. It has to wire up functions and it couldn't find what to wire log to because we don't have a function called log that's actually defined, that has a body. So the way that we can fix this is by fixing our function we need to provide a definition for this log function. In other words, we have to provide a body for this log function. It doesn't have to be inside this file, it can be inside main, but it has to be somewhere. And if we compile this, you'll see that we don't get any errors. If we go back to our file explorer and look at what we've got inside our intermediate folder here, you'll see that we've got two OBJ files because the compiler generates an object file for each of our CPP files. The linker will then take them and stitch them together into an exe file. So in our lovely example, we have our log definition inside this log OBJ file and our main function inside our main.obj file. And so the linker will basically take that log definition from log and put it into a common binary, which is our hello world.exe file, which contains a definition for both main and log. And that is a basic overview of how C works. 
Again, I highly encourage you to check out the in-depth videos about how compiling and linking works because they're gonna be way more information than this video. This video was just made to show you kind of an overview of the pipeline of how you go from source files to an actual binary. As always, don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. If you really enjoyed this video and you wanna see more, you can support me on Patreon. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Whoa.